Hello there and welcome to this series of conversations called Your Voice Matters with Better for Kenya, Equality Now and Capital FM. I'm Janet Mbogwa and as always we've been having conversations shedding light on gender-based violence with different thematic areas and all of this is because it's been 26 years since the Beijing Women's Conference. That was huge then but what's changed? Has there been progress? Um, what remains to be done? We know a lot remains to be done so why do the gaps still exist? And today we're shedding light on the culture of silence when it comes to gender-based violence. And it's something I've said a lot on my social media. Silence means you're being complicit. If you're not speaking up, if you're not speaking out or reporting, are you then enabling this cycle of violence? But could it be more complex than that? I have an incredible panel to help me shed light on this conversation through their own experiences and thoughts. And so without further ado, these ones have to introduce themselves. They are a big deal. <laughs> big deal. <laughs> um, yes, so Valentine Joroge and Catherine Kamal, but you can tell us a little bit more about what you do and why you're passionate mm. about this conversation. So, huh, why am I passionate? Okay, so first of all, I'm the founder and CEO of Datasphere, which is a platform for women to share their stories. And the reason I started it is because I realized we don't listen to women from as basic as a car accident happens and an eyewitness report, you will look for a man to tell you that blue car hit the red car, you will not ask a woman. Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. So I created the platform so African women can share, our, we can share our stories, yes. Yeah, and it's yeah. powerful. I mean, I know I've been on, spoken. I've spoken. Yes. I haven't shared my story, which Valentine said, one day <laughs> you will come just come back. there. So thank you for what you do. You're also a TV presenter. Oh, yes, yes, I'm a TV <laughs> presenter <laughs> on the loop. I mm. read the news. I, I still find it far, hard to believe yeah. that I read the news. Okay. But um, yes. Okay, yeah. great to have you. And Catherine. <laughs> Catherine Kate Kamau. Kate, <laughs> Kate, the actress. That's what they call me, um, or Mama Jerry, Mama Kamau. Um, I'm an actress, of course, and a social media influencer, and most importantly, a voice. So I'm passionate about this conversation because I don't know why, but women come to me all the time. So this was right, and thank you for having me today. No, thank you. Thank you both for how you use your voice. I know you've talked mm -hmm. a lot about teen pregnancy, for example. You speak a lot on different advocacy issues. I talk a lot. You do. It's important. <laughs> it's important that we talk a lot. We get into trouble a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, we do, though, right? Because yeah. you're either talking too much or it's just never enough. You're never... That's true. Your voice is either a trigger to somebody or you need to be silenced, and that's why we're here, to talk about the culture of silence. Mm. Why do you think it persists? I think speaking is a luxury, and I've found that more and more in my media career, which has been uh, 15 plus years. There are consequences when you tell your story. There are consequences when you say, this happened to me, or I did this, or this is what my life looks like. People shun you. I mean, just um, last week, we did um, a feature on the pursuit of child support. And the woman who I spoke to, who's 28, her, the man left her with two boys and then she took him to court and said, you know, you have to acknowledge these are your sons and you need to support them. She's been shut down by her family, even though we blurred her face and we covered her voice and all of this. She's been shut down by her family who recognized her and said, we will not support you. So it's expensive to speak, which mm. is why I speak, because I can afford to speak. Yes, That's I can really afford powerful. the consequences of what I say. Yeah. So I think speaking is a luxury. And in Africa, where so many women's livelihoods and everything are controlled by other people, you just don't have the right to your own voice. That's really powerful to look at it like it's a luxury mm -hmm. and not everyone can afford that. And I know later we'll be joined by Felista Gitonga, who's part of the Equality Now program, to, to shed light on that as well. Um, so she said she speaks because others can't. Why do you do it, Kate? And why do you think it's important that we move away from the culture of silence? I think for me it's because I have a responsibility. I feel like I have a, a, a platform, a big one, and I feel like I need to speak for these women who, you know, maybe because of background and baggage, they never saw anyone speak. You know, your mom got hit, but she never spoke, so you never had role models. You never saw anyone speak for themselves. So I feel like I have a responsibility to do that. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. Can you tell us a little bit more about when you started sharing your own um, story about being a teen mom? And I know that's one of the reasons a lot of people come to you, yeah. right? When you first shared it, what was the feedback like? Because like Valentine has said, sometimes you share your story and the reaction, you just can't yeah. predict it. What was your first reaction? Uh, I remember it was back in college, so we were introducing ourselves. It was orientation day and everyone was introduced. Oh, hi, my name is so-and-so. 
And I stood up and I was like, oh, my name is Catherine Kamau and I'm a mom of one. And the whole class was like, yeah. what the hell? And you know, yeah, and I moved on, introduced myself, and I sat. And after that, and, um, I had like few girls come to me and they're like, you know, I'm a mom too, but I never, I never talk about it. And I'm like, why? I had gone through so much. There's no way I'm going to hide, oh, sorry. There's no way I'm going to hide this. <laughs> I can't hide my son. Like, yeah, I can't hide my son. I felt, I felt like I've done something for myself. And I was like, yeah, I'm a mom. That's the first time I ever spoke about it. And I've never shut my mouth since then about me being a mom. Yeah, have you gotten varied reactions? Definitely uh, dating. Uh, when you say I'm a mom, he, he, they run. Mm -hmm. But you're like, okay, fine, at least I said it, you know? Yeah. So dating, and of course, the stigma was there, you know? You're the girl in the village parties, like, you know? I couldn't go for Christmas parties, I had to stay home, mm -hmm. you know? Even sometimes it's your own family, you know? They keep reminding you. Even a couple, two ayo kikombe apa, siku kweke there, a gun kwa kicho, ukipata umtoto, you're like, okay, what's wrong? You know, <laughs> it's from home. It's, it starts at home, the stigma, and then it's the community and everyone around yeah. you. But I survived it, and yeah, that's why I need to speak. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, I mean, like, I, like that's why you're, you're both here. It's, it's been able to use your voices. How do we get to a place where we can have more people, especially women mm -hmm. and girls, um, what do we need to do to create a safe space for them to speak their truth and to share their stories? I know you do it through your yeah. um, social media and your platform, you do it through Datasphere. Mm. Um, what else needs to happen for us to be able to draw the truth out of so many women who just feel silenced, especially those going through gender-based violence? Um, I think if you're going through GBV though, like your life depends on it, right? Gender-based violence doesn't end. It's not like the guy hits you one day and then the next day he's like, I'm reformed and I'll never hit you again. It escalates, right? Unless some, some drastic thing happens to cut it off. So in that situation, you have to speak because your life literally depends on it. I think what we do to create safe spaces, we create shelters. Women have to be able yeah. to leave. Women have to be able to leave because this, okay, I don't mean this as victim blaming, but by the time you end up in a poisonous relationship where there is violence, it's not like you're being hit and you're standing there calling the guy an angel. Like you're both, there's a pathology at play from both of you. So I think it's important that you both are, have the opportunity to ext to remove yourselves mm. and not be in contact. Otherwise, you know, you end up back in that, I'm sorry, here are the flowers, <laughs> da da da, oh, mm. he loves me, oh, now you're back together. Like, <laughs> you mm. know what I mean? Like, you need to create something that drastically changes that dynamic. And that, to me, is distance. So I would say, um, especially because I hope government is listening, we need shelters. Yeah. We need safe houses. We need a place where a woman can go with her children and be away from that situation for months at a time, mm -hmm. not worried about survival. Because also we see from data when a woman leaves a violent situation, that's when she's most likely to be killed. Yeah. The violence goes even higher. So I don't think there's any alternative. There are, you just have to have sh shelters yeah. and safe houses, yes. People need to feel safe and protected. Over and above that question, um, Kate, that Valentine has said, because we're in this space where we're on mainstream media, social media, what more do you think needs to happen in that space? Because we've seen how Twitter just goes downhill. Do you know? You're trying to have a conversation. Twitter is its own GBV. It yes, <laughs> honestly, it's honestly, honestly because violence. you're trying to raise awareness and you're saying this has happened, you know, victim blaming has taken place, and then suddenly, you toxic feminists, mm, or yeah, you deserved it. Why did, she, why, didn't, why did she take his money anyway? Mm. So what can we do in that space to just kind of, I can't say sanitize it because that's just a, a dream, but how do we begin to address this, the, the culture of toxic speak when it comes to what happens on social media and you can also speak to that mm. but as somebody who is on social media i get into trouble a lot yeah <laughs> what, what comes to mind when you're getting into trouble what do you wish yeah. would be different in terms of how people discuss these things on social media i think we have a responsibility to also i think for me is learning the, the language to put my point across because I get very emotional and I'm there and I, I just want to say what I feel. How could you do this to this person? You know, I get so emotional about it. I've learned to take a back seat, analyze. Sometimes I'll text Janet, what do you think? I'm, you know, I, the language first and to also not speak from a point of privilege because it's easy to tell a woman, just leave. You have a job. You have a job, you have, you know, you can support yourself. And I think we need to start empowering our women economically so that 
when you have your own kibanda, you have joined a kasako, it's easier for you to, you know, even when you leave this toxic relationship, you can still, you know, take care of yourself and your kids. Mm -hmm. So we need to stop also, you know, yeah, kuna shelter, and then where do I go mm -hmm. from the shelter? What's in the shelter? Mm -hmm. You know, saba nime toroka kidogo, but I, I go back because I have nothing to myself. So mm -hmm. for me, I, I want to, to start, you know, empowering women economically, um, you know, um, pointing them towards where they can get funds to start their businesses so that they are, you know, they're stronger economically mm -hmm. and maybe they're able to make such drastic decisions, which are important and yeah. should be taken, yeah. You know, that's such an important mm -hmm. point. I think also to what you said, it's about being able to make something for yes. yourself. Um, again, the question of, of social media, where sometimes the culture of silence is actually, it, they almost want you to remain silent. And then you find that when you are having the conversation, um, you kind of want it to become a healthy mm -hmm. dialogue. But I, like I said, what I've noticed is it just tends to escalate. How do we begin to address that? Because again, they'll slide into your DM and say, why are you why are you out there running your mouth? So they're kind of telling you, be quiet. I actually find oh, yeah. social media quite violent when it comes to sharing stories. I don't, I, I don't know that it's actually the space for women to be speaking very like vulnerable or personal issues. I just don't find it a safe space. So I would say to women, have boundaries. Maybe this is not where you do it. Mm. Yeah, maybe social me media is not your platform. Because one of the things we do with Data Sphere, the women, before you, sp you went through the program, mm. it's a four week program. And we ask, we show the women to prepare their lives, like the people in your life, to hear your story. Let them know, I'm going to speak. I'm going to talk about being a teen mom. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you tell the father of your son, I'm going to share this story. So he's not sitting in an audience, stunned, like, Hiya, I was the worst <laughs> mother in the world. Yeah. <laughs> or I abandoned, this is what yeah. it was like for Kate if I left or when we fell apart, whatever it is. So he's not hearing it for the mm. first time. I think you need to also be responsible in how you share that story. Because you don't live your life in isolation. It impacts other people. And then now your mother will be like, hey, Kate, you don't have to say that. She doesn't care. No, but also her friends will ask her about your story. So she needs to be ready. So there's, I think there's a level of responsibility there. With, But again, when someone is in a violent home, being beaten and her life and her children are in danger you don't have the luxury of that you just need to get out and run and find mm. we need shelters we, we do need shelters yeah. i know we had that conversation yeah. last week and, and sometimes it also goes back to culturally what do people believe you know i know the other day i, I spent some time somewhere where they were explaining the different ways in which um the system fails survivors along the way so yes you're in a abusive yes. um relationship or home or you've been violated, you go get help. So she's a doctor. And then when you take it back, the police are trying to protect the perpetrator and yes. say, I see Mskizane, just talk about it. And so they'll call the perpetrator mm. and say, hey, mama, you kwaapa? Watu wana sikumananga kidogo, sinindoa? Ndoa bila drama sita. The church has been a huge failure. Mm. Oh. Yes, you heard me. I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. I love Jesus. <laughs> but the church has been a mm. huge failure in preaching to women submission and silence and endurance and, and Proverbs that and, and all these words and forbearance and I don't know all these words. It's like, yeah, you know, I can pray and not be hit. I can be safe while I worship Jesus. It's not like <laughs> the two are in, you mm. know, like not compatible. So I think the church has also been a huge failure there. Mm, that's yeah. interesting. So it, it almost, if we want to stop this culture of silence, it, it has to be in every single um, space, whether it's a place of worship, whether it's in schools, the homes, um, law enforcement, government. It takes such a multi-stakeholder approach. Mm. I think sometimes the issue is that it's so siloed. It's like, oh, women advocates speak on this issue mm -hmm. but it exists everywhere but you see right? if you don't believe a woman with as basic an example as an eyewitness report how then are you going to believe when she tells you i'm in danger for my life from my husband or the father of, or my partner whatever it is if you we need to normalize believing women just taking a woman's word for it yeah. even in your own company do you notice that your male employees like you'll ask them to do something and then they'll kind of look around like mm. Is someone else going to validate this instruction? <laughs> like, who are you waiting for? Yeah. <laughs> so Even in the at home, right? Dad, dad, when dad speaks, okay, I think mm. it's serious. Now let's do it. So I think mm. now that is part of the problem. Mm. Like it seeps through. So when a woman says, I'm in danger, it's like, are you sure? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That's true. The gaslighting is everywhere from something as basic as I told you I had a long day. I told you I was in the office. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's, you know it's, what I mean? It's yes. crazy you're saying that. I've been saying that nonstop. The gaslighting, the, have you, I said this last week, have you tried everything? Yeah. I'm like, what is that? When you say try everything, in terms of saving a relationship, mm -hmm. they say, have you tried everything? So I'm like, is it that you want me to break and then now I can get help? You know what I mean? It's like, yes. it has to be worst case scenario. It's okay, don't lead me down that, I ranted about that last time because I think it goes back to what yeah. she's saying is, I think we really need to listen. We can hear, but we really need to listen. If Kate's saying, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm not safe, I feel like I'm not okay, don't silence or don't gaslight, yeah. just listen. And, and even if it's just, her word, and accept like, the word yes, as well. what yeah. she's saying as reality, not like she might be exaggerating, because mm -hmm. we just tend to not believe women. Yeah. And also, I think what you, uh, Valentine said about, you know, social media not being a safe space for us to speak. Uh, and we keep saying uh, we want our role models to be able to speak as well, those who are going through GBV. But then again, mm -hmm. when you tell your story, then they use it against you. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm trying to be vulnerable here, but mm -hmm. next time I'm speaking on a different, ah, we were like, you're like, no, yeah. I'm trying to share so that, you know, by just telling your story, you never know. I guess so many DMs, so many DMs on, on GBV. You try to uh, point them to hot numbers or mm -hmm. counseling or anything, some of them don't work. And I remember, I think, I don't know whether it's Janet or telling us, at some point I, it got so overwhelming for me. I realized I'm so tired and she told me, you know, it's not your burden to carry, mm -hmm. even for your role models. Mm -hmm. We break and we don't know how to help sometimes, but um, I'm glad that they speak and I want them to continue sharing. I may not be able to help you, but I can point you to someone who can. And please, when we tell our stories, even us as people you look up to, please believe us. Yeah. We are not chasing cloud. Sometimes you're not chasing cloud. You're speaking your truth and it's hard. Mm. It's hard. Sometimes you have no one to talk to, mm. you know? Yeah. And also the story, in as much as I'm saying social media might not be the space to share. Mm. I interviewed a woman a few weeks ago who was telling me she had been beaten for four years, the violence was just getting worse and worse. And then she told, she even faked her labor. Like that's how bad it was. She faked her labor, peed on herself just to escape a horrible situation, went into hospital and begged the radiologist, please, please just say I need a C-section. Otherwise, if I go home, I'm gonna die. And still, after healing, and now her baby was a few months old, she's on Google, am I in an abusive relationship? Mm -hmm. She had not put it together after years that this was an abusive relationship. So also we need to talk about what is abuse more and more because she was like, uh, when she said that to me, I was like, you're kidding, right? Like, yeah. what do you mean? You faked your own labor. You told the guy you're in danger of your life. Did this seem healthy to you? Mm. Speaking on that, I interviewed um, a survivor recently who was saying a lot of the time it's, it's, it's normalized. So she was in an abusive relationship. And she was being told by her friends, yeah, it's because he loves you that he hits you. Yeah. And it was completely normal for her. So she endured. She kind of felt something was off. And then eventually she said, one day my friend just said, let's go for a, a session. There's this interesting empowerment session. So I, I don't know what that is, but I'll come with you. In this session, they're being told, this is what abuse looks like. You don't deserve to be abused. It's not. And she said, she was telling them, no, 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 no. If he abuses you, he loves you. So she had to now unlearn it. She's now 24. Her, her story is going to... Uh, this weekend 24. at some point. She's 24, I think she, this was four years ago. She lost her pregnancy because of the abusive relationship, but she had normalized it because her peers had said it's normal. Her peers were going through the same thing and they're like, no, he loves you. That's what they do. So you can imagine how much work needs to happen. But imagine you can and they make a joke out of it. Ah, yeah. And you laugh yeah, like, and it's ah, like it's like normal. And they are 21, 19. Yeah. So when you we're here talking, there's a lot yeah. of work to be done. There's so there much is. education and awareness. We speak because we have access, because we know better, but there's still so much unlearning that needs to happen. And I think when we normalize and internalize abuse, that's how you remain silent. So that's how the culture of silence continues. So we'll come back after this short break and speak to Equality Now, learn about what their program is doing and what more we can all do to end the culture of silence. We'll be back.
Welcome back. You're watching Your Voice Matters, which is with Equality Now, Better for Kenya and Capital FM. Conversations talking about 26 years since the Beijing Women's Conference with a focus on gender-based violence. And today we're talking about the culture of silence. We're still joined on set by Valentine Joroge and Catherine Kamau, better known as Kate Actress. And now we have Felista Gitonga, who is a programs officer at Equality Now. Thank you for joining us. I know you've listened to everyone and taken it in. I think before I ask the first question, what's your reaction to the conversation we've had earlier? What stood out? And what are your thoughts around the culture of silence? All right. Um, so as part of the conversation, um, what I heard from the two ladies was that um, if you look at the issue of abuse, a lot of people don't understand what abuse is. Mm -hmm. And people think abuse is when somebody comes and hits you. But abuse creeps up, uh, creeps up uh, creeps up on women. For example, it starts very small. You are in a relationship with a boyfriend. Then all of a sudden, he starts, you know, um, I don't like f uh, Janet as your friend. Why don't you cut her off? And then gives you a certain reason. Then you cut Janet off. Then you wear a dress and he tells you, you know, I don't like that dress. Uh, why don't you take it off? So slowly, the abuser is taking away your power. Slowly, the abuser is removing your support system from your life. And by the time now he's hitting you, he has full control of you. You don't have the friends you could lean on. You don't have, um, you know, your self-esteem. And even in some cases, when they notice the woman has resources, they're like, um, you know, if we want to have this relationship, I have to have access to your bank account. Whatever you're earning, uh, I should, you should give it to me so that I make decision uh, on behalf of this family. So abuse doesn't start um, by a person hitting you. It's, it comes slowly and slowly. And I remember at a certain point working on a program called Men to Men program where um, there was this man who was uh, working with uh, men to address the issue of GBV. And one of the things he told me is that when you're talking about a GBV to men, never tell them uh, the stories, for example, of the lady who was uh, pregnant, uh, who cheated on her husband because they were having this issue about um, not having children and he ended up cutting uh, her hand. So don't talk about that because all of them will say, I don't do that. I've never cut off the hands mm. of my wife. Mm. So what you have to demonstrate is these small behaviors um, that are happening within the context of the relationship. Are you happy if your girlfriend goes out and meets with her, her friends? Does that make you feel a certain way? Then if now you start showing them how the abuse is creeping in and then by the time he's done with the exercise, the men now begin to realize that um, actually, in a way, they are abusers, even though they have never hit the woman in their life. They are perpetuating abuse. And o the problem with that is that also, when a woman is in that situation, it goes across all the other areas of her life. She's not able to negotiate for small things in her life. Even when she, it, it's in the office, she's not able to negotiate even for her salary, for boundaries in terms of uh, how much time can I give to this job? Uh, they do overtime even then they're not needed because it's, mm. it's the self-esteem has been taken mm. away. So that is how abuse um, it manifests slowly. Sometimes slowly. It's, it's, yeah. it could be, you know, obvious and f from er very early on, but a lot of the time yes. it's gradual. I know we were talking before we came back around um, how the pandemic really, I mean, gender-based violence was still happening, but I think, I guess it just, it, sh it held a mirror to society and I think made things worse in many ways. So I want us to talk a little bit about um, shifting um, about the, the violence itself. That, that's mm -hmm. what we were saying earlier, which is we can talk about the fact that gender-based violence happens. Um, a lot of the times the survivors or victims are women and children at the hands of the perpetrators who are men. Mm -hmm. And yet, and I stand to be corrected, this is just an open conversation. It's how I think a lot of people feel. The conversation is about let's empower the survivors. Let's educate. Let's tell, teach the children consent. All well and good. Who and how, who is speaking to the violence? Who is speaking to the fact that it's the perpetrators? We also need to talk about how to nip that in the bud, you know, to stop. And so I know it's complex. I know it's a trigger. 
but any comments, I know Valentine was like, I have something to say about that. <laughs> I, I will say, say it, and then we'll invite you both to say that. But um, your thoughts on speaking to the perpetrators and speaking to the, the violence that has brought us here to have this okay. conversation, yeah. There's something we've seen in our lifetime that was completely undone and redesigned very effectively. And it's a very private issue, which is how we have sex. 1978, HIV turned up, and by the 90s, we were all having sex differently. We were using condoms. And it's an embarrassing conversation. It's a private, invasive conversation. But we had it because our lives depended on it. If governments approached GBV, violence against women, and our bodies with the same level of intention, we would not be having these conversations. Mm. Because fundamentally, as Africans, you're taught as a young girl, your body has a quantifiable value in dowry mm. and so any injury that happens to you can be rectified in a quantifiable financial monetary way and that I think is the root of the problem where women's bodies are seen as property so whatever you do to a woman's body you can rectify with money you can apologize the men will speak nobody will ask you about your arm or your leg or whatever happened to you right the people who own you will speak that, I think, is at the root of the problem. And I think to rectify that, we need a whole new system of education where it's in the curriculum from standard one. My son is five. He should learn that the girl next to him and him, their bodies are the same. And they're sacrosanct. And he has no right to hit anyone, and no one has the, the right to hit him. I think it starts at that level. Yeah. That's powerful. <laughs> it's. <laughs> I, I was ranting about Lobola and Dowry <laughs> earlier today. I so think it's interesting. Dowry is such a problem. It, it's a very complex such led. A problem. So I know if we say that for some people, it's like, hey, don't don't take away yeah, our, culture, our culture. But there's a lot of what she's saying. There's yeah. financial implications exactly. around yeah, it that exactly. make you property. Mm -hmm. sort yeah, and, of. and you submit to it. Yeah. And he owns me. You mm. almost take pride yeah. in it. Yeah. My diary was yeah, like, it's three million. Oh, mm. your it's two million. Like, <laughs> So he owns you. Mm. Yes. He owns you. And in different, I mean, globally, GBV is a problem. But in different contexts, the mm -hmm. problem is informed by different cultural norms. Mm -hmm. In this context, in the African context, that we cannot ignore dowry. Mm. We just cannot. Absolutely. Yeah. What are your I thoughts really here? look forward to the day when, mm. you see the way we hold rapists accountable. And you're like, these are the perpetrators. Even for the the men you know perpetrators of gbv like when you're conducting an interview they, they just run through yeah i was an alcoholic i abused my wife and then he moves on mm. quickly like stop him there mm. did, did you stop mm. why you you know mm. did you take responsibility if you healed can we have men talk about i used to abuse my wife and these are the reasons and these are the consequences they, they need to talk about it why don't they talk about it that's very interesting mm. because i think a lot of the time it's almost like in a, in a roundabout way many times, perpetrators are absolved because there's no consequences. Mm -hmm. Yes. The justice system yeah. has failed many survivors because mm -hmm. to your point, you pay somebody mm -hmm. or it's just, just apologize, let's just have a mediation. Mm -hmm. So it absolves you. I mean, I was talking to somebody the other day who said there's a case that's been going on for five years. She said there's no reason why it should have been a five-year case. Mm -hmm. But this is a man who said, you, you're never going to, I'm never going to face the consequences because he's, he's powerful. He has money and he keeps changing um, mm. the people who represent him and it delays the process. So to your point, I think there's, th we are absolving them in a quiet way because they see, ah, this case has taken five, six years. I guess I can get away mm. with it. So interesting. Your thoughts on, I think, what um, Kate and Valentine have said. Yeah. So some time back, South Africa made a very radical thing that um, some people you know, had put some backlash uh, on South Africa. Um, and the thing was that they tried to do a study of how many men have raped in, in South Africa. Mm. And it was quite um, a huge percentage. As you know, within the African space, South Africa, uh, GBV, sexual violence is, is, is very high. And what they were trying to do is, you know, for most of the time we look at the victim, but we are not looking at the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And even looking at a certain incident that happened uh, on radio a few weeks ago, the fact that there was a victim and people chose to put the victim to task and not speak about the person who is committing the crime is also a societal kind of um, mm. socializing. Yeah. 
because I think as a society, we tend to believe this is a psychology behind why societies uh, blame the victim is that when we live in a community, we tend to hope that we live in a very safe environment. And so when somebody says, I got raped, we try to make it look like, well, maybe you did something out of mm -hmm. the norm. Mm -hmm. That is why you ended up getting raped. So that's why we start asking, so how are you well dressed? dressed yeah. uh, how did you talk to this man? Mm -hmm. Because we don't want to believe that amongst us in this community that we live in, there is somebody who is an abuser. There is uh, somebody who is committing pedophilia to even the children who, you know, are living within our community. But then I remember um, something else that happened uh, in India, a case of a girl who was raped um, in the bus at night uh, by s a few young men when she was going out at night. Mm -hmm. And I remember an Israeli journalist did, um, uh, I think, a documentary. And she gave the, uh, the, the rapist a chance, one of the rapists a chance to speak in that documentary. And people asked, but oh. why did you give this rapist a chance to speak? Mm -hmm. And she said, I allowed that rapist to speak because I wanted us to have a reflection as a society. And she said a lot of Indian men wrote to her and told her, you know, I don't see myself as an abuser. I would never abuse a woman. But what shocked me, every belief that that rapist has about women, I also have the same. I believe women should not be walking out at night. I believe they shouldn't be fraternizing with men at night. So that rape culture that exists within the community where we have certain standards, patriarchal, misogynistic standards that we hold women to, they facilitate this culture of silence. They facilitate mm -hmm. for perpetrators to continue living within the community um, and continue to abuse um, women over and over again. And what is usually shocking is that sometimes these things come out when somebody has abused like three to four women. So then that's when it becomes, ah, this is a crisis. For example, somebody like uh, Epstein in, in mm -hmm. the big Me Too movement. The man existed in that space, abusing women, built an empire that is built on harming women, uh, violating women, yet people knew about it, did business with this person, praised this person, awarded this person, and the bigger the, th this person became, the more and more women got abused. Mm -hmm. So this fear and failure for us to call abuse within the community and call it what it is, then it's what continues this culture of silence because it embodies the, the perpetrator mm -hmm. and now, um, as I, uh, Valentine said, the privilege of being able to speak. Mm -hmm the audacity to be able to speak. Victims look at themselves and, uh, and they ask, if I speak, what do I have to hold on after that? Because yeah. you also learn from a very young age, like it's, it's things that are said in the home, isn't yes. it? Like now the, that question, or if a rape happened, Ay, mm. what was That's she wearing? Yeah, exactly. Ay, you go to a man's house at night, what was she expecting? Yes. So those things we, we learn from a young age, we internalize. We're like, oh, so if because this happened, even if it was a date and I thought I was safe, I'm the f one at fault because I miscalculated. Yeah. It's my fault because I've had two babies with this guy and now he's hit me. It's my fault because blah, blah. So you learn not to, s you silence you hear all the voices that will silence you. Mm. Mm. You, you have already, we can all write down checklist. the statement, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Yes, exactly, the checklist, we mm. have it. Mm. I wonder, do men have a checklist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know what, very, that's a really good question. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know that they do because women- Because I love that yeah. the, the Indian rapist spoke mm. and then other people are like, yo, those things he said, see them- yeah. I believe them too. So, believe yeah, so do they have a checklist? Mm. They, sh they should mm. have a checklist yeah. mm -hmm. of do I believe these things about women? Yeah. And that if, if I believe them, I need to start unlearning them. Yes. Because if I believe them, then yeah. I can very well be a perpetrator. Yeah. Yes. When people on the timeline say things like, um, she had it coming, I'm always like, this, this world is alive with perpetrators, who, people who are about to become perpetrators. Because right. yes. in their mind, mm -hmm. they said she deserved to be yeah. pushed off or she deserved to be, I remember when there was the cases of femicide, mm -hmm. you know, because it had to do with, but she accepted the transaction. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, there's so many people here who have potential, 
because they've normalized these things yes. in the checklist yes. that yeah. they can tweet and say, but then why would you take his they money? Have, it's like, they have yeah. already an articulate women. justification. And it's, and it's the, the yeah. moments the women tell him. No. That happens yeah. a lot as well. And you're a yeah. woman. Yeah. And uh, they don't even understand what being a rape apologist is. They don't yeah. understand mm. it. You have to go to the comments and explain. This is why you shouldn't say this. They don't. Mm. And they're like, oh, okay. Now I get it. We've also yeah. normalized women being vigilant about their own personal exactly. security. Mm -hmm. From a very young age. Mm. Like it's mm. not a national responsibility. Mm -hmm. I'm a citizen. I pay taxes. It's not your job to keep me safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all my job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I pay the taxes and then I, I do what I like we said, we pay more. Because clearly <laughs> I can't even trust my own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I think a lot of what we're saying here is this conversation needs to start early. Mm -hmm. um, and it needs to be in every facet of life, mm -hmm. like school, ETC. Because I think from a very young age, girls are told, sit with your legs like this. Mm -hmm. Young girls, mm -hmm. you're already kind of preparing yourself for worst case scenario, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You're told if you're wearing a dress, please make sure you sit nicely. As a girl, even if you're sort of like 10 years old, mm -hmm. I can, you can even speak to when you get your first period. I remember I was told, mm -hmm. don't let a boy touch you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you get so pregnant. yes, I think sometimes people mean well. Mm -hmm. um, I think this, we can speak to the culture of trying to unlearn even things that the older generation believed. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it's passed on and from a very young age you're told, look after yourself, look after your body, protect your body. Mm. Yeah. And you're thinking, okay, so I'm already in this. What does that mean? That the means you're dangerous. The world is yeah. dangerous. Yeah. And you're 10, 11, 12 years old. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and you're maybe told. The other thing she mentioned and, mm. and I thought about is, is the issue of the checklist mm -hmm. for women. When you're going out, you have a mental checklist. Mm -hmm. Even when you're going to a certain part of the town, you have a mental checklist. Should I wear the skirt that looks like this? Or should mm -hmm. I wear a trouser? Or should I wear that? Then I also observed within the community, we don't have a sense of empathy with yeah. women. Mm -hmm. So if somebody truly believes they could never undergo through a certain kind of abuse, they see as if women are lying. Mm -hmm. And for example, when you look at sexual abuse, uh, rape, and um, sexual violence in general, um, men are never really afraid of sexual violence as the way women are of sexual violence. So you go to a girl school and ask them, what is your greatest fear? Okay. A percentage of girls there will tell you rape mm -hmm. is one of their greatest fears. Mm -hmm. And because for them, for the young men, they have never had to go out at night and worry, besides being stolen, somebody might rape me. They, it's very easy for somebody to say, you know what, um, I think there's something wrong you did. Explain to us more. And I remember there was that case of the rugby, you know, mm. players yeah. who, you know, raped this girl. A and I saw how Twitter held her to account, up to account you know, and, 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 and shielded these two men in the sense of, you know, uh, they, they, they are good men, we know them, they are players in, in, in this, you know, Shuja, it's, it's rugby. Yes, it's you it's know them in one context. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yet you don't have a sexual relationship with this mm -hmm. person, so yeah. how can you speak? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then it's like protect our heroes. Now, mm -hmm. the person you want to hold to account in terms of proving, the burden of proof now is with the woman. We don't want to look at... Um, the men we don't want to you know evaluate and so how do we begin you. to change that your thoughts each of you on i know it may sound like an obvious question yeah. but i feel like we've belabored this point many times which yeah. is we really need you know is it men to speak out we talk about male allyship what does that look like how much of a role does it play in addressing the pattern of violence perpetrated by men any immediate thoughts on how do we, because we're, we're hoping, you know, these conversations, we don't have them just for the sake of having them. Mm -hmm. We're trying to ask ourselves, it's been 26 years. You know, that was a huge moment many years ago. I, I was very young, but I do remember if somebody made a feisty comment, they'd say, oh, when you went to Beijing, or you know what I mean? Like, it, yeah. it's, it really resonated I because wish women, I went to Beijing. <laughs> 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 women, women really found their power and their voice. And, you know, a lot of them paved the way for a lot of what we can do. Mm -hmm. But now it's a reflection. It's taking stock and saying, but hang on. We're still talking about the culture of silence. We're still talking about GBV. And now this new conversation around male allies. Mm -hmm. It's become a, mm. a big new term. Mm -hmm. So okay. how, do we, how do we speak to how men mm -hmm. 
can. <laughs> Valentine is like, let me say <laughs> <laughs> how, what I, men can do. Because there's a lot of I do men I do out there. Yeah. I do think about this consistently, mm. especially because I'm raising awesome. a man. Yeah. Mm. Yes, especially because. Yeah, we're raising boys. Yes, we're well, yeah. yes, yeah. well, raising these men. Yeah. So, um, I think it's down to education. Mm. I really think at the, a very fundamental level, men and boys need to understand that a woman has a complete right to her body. Mm -hmm. Complete. And if she says no, it's a no. It doesn't even matter if you're in the middle of the sexual act and she changes her mind. Mm. The same way you can change your mind, be like, Sijiski, Ataye, Ajiski. And you just need to accept yeah. and figure yourself out. Mm. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I, I think it's as basic. It comes in through it, education. Mm. I think we need some, a shift in our curriculum where you teach that to someone mm. so that we listen to girls. A young girl says, I don't want to eat. And there you are. You must. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, this, these are the same things that then add up to, I don't want to do this. No, you must. I don't want to eat this. No, you must. I don't want to remain in this marriage. Oh, have you done everything? Mm. Have you prayed? Have you prayed? Have you fasted? Have you, yeah. have Did you, you say, have you, uh, have you prayed? <laughs> have you prayed? Yeah. <laughs> I mean... I get so ignorant. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's, also it's talking to the perpetrators. Mm. You know, we need to talk. Do we have success stories where people have been jailed? Can we tell those stories yeah. mm -hmm. so that we give hope to the victims? So it's mm. possible someone can be jailed. I remember the Gidurai girl who was abused in the bus. Though, you know, yeah. you remember yes. they were jailed. I think for over seven years. Are they no, still in actually? That, that, is, that, is something, that is something. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's tell <laughs> those it was stories. That robbery with violence yes. Yes. that was added to their charges. Oh. But let, okay. let's. But also, let's say this. <laughs> Thanks to Beijing, we do have some of the best laws in the world when it comes to yeah. sexual violence mm -hmm. and what what should happen to perpetrators. Mm -hmm. What I would like to see our DPP do is prosecute more of those mm -hmm. cases yeah. because prosecution is, I think, a single digit percentage. Mm -hmm. I, oh yeah, the Berlin story is quiet now. There you go. We, we make a lot of I'm noise. I'm always DCI yeah, follow. Oh. Mm. Yeah. And Nothing I think is happening. it's it's good you say that, Catherine, because yeah. I think that is those are the ways that we mm -hmm. enable. Because I really think mm -hmm. a lot of perpetrators feel absolved by that. Mm -hmm. True. Like yeah. they'll forget. Yeah. You know, something else. Yeah. 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 So it's you wait speaking for the next education. Scandal. I think that's a key one. Prosecution. Yeah. That's a key one. Mm. Um, shelters. I think is a key one. Mm. As somebody who has, who is in a program that kind of deals with harmful practices, for example, and, mm -hmm. and GBV, what else can you add to the ways in which we can begin to have a different conversation around the culture of silence when mm -hmm. it comes to gender-based violence? I think I would say what she said, teach boys and girls bodily autonomy from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And then also we need to have a conversation about consent. And, yeah. and as, as a country, as a people, as a community, we need to have a conversation about consent. And um, the reason why this is a big issue is because I find a lot of people want to make consent look as if it's a blood thing, as if it's um, something difficult to do. Like, you know, as she said, if we are having sex in the moment and I decide, you know what, um, stop. Then, of course, now, especially that one has been a huge debate when mm -hmm. it comes to mm -hmm. consent. Mm -hmm. I find in a lot of like radio stations, they pick that scenario. Mm -hmm. What if we are already in the moment? Uh, is it even possible? It's for, just for a me moment, and yes. there are many in life. You mm. will have others. Mm. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's not an emergency. Exactly. <laughs> and I, I changed that, my and mind. I changed yeah. my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And there is uh, a certain analogy that is used, uh, and it's about you know giving tea. Whereby, um, mm. if I come to your house, uh, Janet, and we had agreed that uh, I'll take tea, and then you cook tea, you serve tea. You, if now I decide, I don't want your tea. Does it mean you take that cup and force, and, it, and down force it down mm. my throat? Mm. And also there was another one around the using of the car because also uh, in situations where women have been raped by somebody mm. they're in a relationship with and people said, you know, if you are in a relationship, how can you be raped? Mm -hmm. The analogy is around if today you ask me for my car, I give you my car and you use it. And uh, tomorrow you borrow, I give you. So does it mean the next day, if you come pick the keys and want to use my car and I said no, 
that doesn't mm. apply. Mm -hmm. So there are different situations. We could where even be married. Yes. Oh. We own the car together. Mm. Exactly. Mm. And I decide <laughs> to do not But it does car. not mean that I can drive the car every single <laughs> exactly. day. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I have to ask. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So consent. Oh, consent. Yes. Consent. Yes. consent <laughs> is not a difficult thing. We have decided to make it complicated, complicated but mm -hmm. it's very straightforward. And I think it's something we should start um, teaching our children from a very young age. Uh, for example, as equality now, we have been part of, you know, the movement that has pushed for things like, you know, child marriage and FGM to be put in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Things about uh, uh, sexual consent should be put in the curriculum when they're being taught about bodily autonomy mm -hmm. and their sexuality. If we are putting climate change in the curriculum, yeah. why shouldn't we put issues Be like Because consent? these issues also stretch. Yeah. The same person who believes that they have rights to your body for life because they married you and exactly. it's a for life con uh, contract, then also believes that they have the right to tell you how many children to have, mm -hmm. when to have them. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. oh. Like your body yeah. fully does not. So that's why the co autonomy conversation I think is so basic yeah. is because it's the beginning of all these other rooted issues. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think I mentioned this in the, the last episode we did, which is around when somebody is trying to hug your child and they don't want mm. to and you're forcing them. That's already <laughs> a breach of consent. It is. And it's, I don't know if it was Valentine who pointed it or somebody, when you're like, just go hug them. And mm. it's like, no, don't, you don't have to tell no. them mm. to go. I mean, you have to be polite. You should yeah. say hello. Mm. Maybe you can do a high five. You yeah. decide what that hello looks like. But, but you, don't you, have to. you don't have to rub yourself against another yeah. person. And maybe when you put it that way, you mm -hmm. understand what you're asking your child yeah. to yeah. do. Yeah. But and I like something that Something I also learned recently is to stop sexualizing children relationship. You know, oh, that's my in-law, that's my daughter-in-law. Yes. It looks cute, but it's, it's wrong. Mm. You're telling this young boy, oh, that one will be your wife. And you're already sexualizing this. It's, it's wrong. And yeah. I, I had to learn because mm -hmm. I was there, oh, but it's an in-law. No. You shouldn't. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of unlearning, yeah. I think, and it's every day, and you have to be intentional because yeah. yes. some things are so ingrained in you. Mm -hmm. Things mm -hmm. that you normalized for the longest time, and as you and get older, yes. you get more exposed. And even like, for the middle class who have house help, that's another conversation where when do you, um, does your child have the uh, capacity to say, I don't want to be washed by so and so? Yeah. Or I'm learning, um, we are potty training, I don't want to be wiped by so and so. Like they should give that permission to this new person in the mm -hmm. house. Half the, half the time we don't ask, they're like, hey, nani, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, and you should give your child, your child should say when they are comfortable for that to happen. Exactly. Yes. But I think one of the biggest reasons that we still have these conversations is because in a way it's socially normalized, unfortunately, mm -hmm. gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. It's quietly, so it's- I so don't think it's quiet, Janet. I think it's, but it's very social, loudly it's loud, but it's normalized where you go to it's church loudly and you'll be told <laughs> pray and fast and you'll mm. be told submit and you, you'll go to the cops in need mm. of help and they'll tell you, ah, I but won't get mm. well, well, you know, they'll yes. call the perpetrator themselves. Mm. Yeah. So I think it's, I don't think it's quiet. Mm. I think there's a quiet and then there's the, the loud one, the one you're saying. Mm. I just feel like we, people get uncomfortable with these conversations because you ask yourself, and I know these conversations have happened before where maybe a few men have spoken up and said, did I cross a line? It's uncomfortable, but I think we need to keep having these very uncomfortable conversations. Mm -hmm. um, it takes guts because then, you know, like you said, you're putting yourself out there to, for people to come back and call you all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Yes, I like the point you made about you have a platform you talked about, I have the luxury to I have something to hold on to. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes those things are taken advantage of and they keep people quiet mm. because there is a normalization and acceptance of the way things are. Mm. And until we speak to that, we won't really move forward. Mm. Until we speak to the fact that, A, imagine we've accepted mm. violence. We need to talk about the fact that we've completely, completely normalized violence as part and parcel of our society. I don't know that it's called out as brutally. I think it's starting to be called out. Yeah. But I also think there's still too many dissenting voices that say it's in your head, yes. it's your fault, mm -hmm. and that those dissenting voices are still not quieted as much as they need to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. We allow them to take over timelines, yeah. to trend. Yeah. We allow them to speak to employees the way they want to. We allow them to, to continue to harm mm -hmm. um, yeah. teenage girls and then we're not punishing 
and prosecuting. And in a way, by not doing that, mm -hmm. we have accepted it. And I love you know. what the new generation is doing also. Mm -hmm. I loved what they did with the Volins case. They were shaming the victim. They put his mm -hmm. face all over the Oh, the perpetrator, yes. Yes, yeah, they mm -hmm. did that. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that's good. We are yeah. making progress because unlike yeah. us, we couldn't even, yeah. you know, you yeah. someone is in power. There's someone powerful. You can't even say his name. Mm -hmm. You say, yeah, I've, I've been abused. You can't name him. But they are doing it. They are putting the, vic the perpetrator's faces. Yeah. Do stop talking about the victim. Mm -hmm. I mean, Alone. Let's talk about. Let's the talk about this yeah. person. Let's, let's know it. him, not a man. Mm -hmm. This, Name this him. person did yeah. this, and this is his face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's something mm -hmm. I'd ask us to do as family and as sisters and as friends is in the absence of these government shelters, in the absence of these safe houses for women to run to, mm -hmm. be that safe space mm -hmm. for that woman. Because half the time, like what you're saying about it being silent, I think it's that. Some, sometimes a woman is going through something and she can't even talk to her own mom. She can't mm. talk to an auntie. They're very concerned with how will we look to society and how this marriage yeah. needs to work. Mm. Now these kids, these grandchildren are coming to live with me. Yes, they're coming to live with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Just accept mm. to be, let's be each other's safe spaces mm. because we don't have external help right now. Right that's, now. Where, that's how things stand. Yeah, so let's purpose to just... Listen, accept that woman's reality. Listen, hear what she's telling you, and mm. then fix it. Like if, even because when you're coming out of an abusive relationship, you're not strong. You know, like you yes. were saying, your self-esteem is shattered. Mm. Yeah. You doubt all. You doubt your decision making. You don't have confidence in your choices yeah. because you chose this guy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. He dated other women. Yeah. They, the, after date number two, they said no, but you, you kept him for some reason, mm -hmm. and now you're like, you're like, mm -hmm. why did I keep that? That is the psychology of somebody who is being abused. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So let's be each other's shelters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Can we also talk yeah. about? Oh, okay, just okay. No, please, the, please keep your points, yeah. and then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. we'll come to that as we yeah. as we wind up. Yeah. On something yeah. they have said, but they also said at the beginning around the social media space and the fact that you know you get into trouble mm -hmm. as women, mm -hmm. and also the, you see a lot of violence within that space. The government of Kenya, I think, uh, two years ago did a study on violence against women and the online space was seen as one of the spaces where women experience violence the most. And why this is concerning is because you see technology and these platforms, they're, they're here with us now. Mm -hmm. they, they are changing lives. Mm -hmm. We are doing businesses in these um, platforms. We are meeting people in these platforms. But when women are in those spaces and experiencing the violence, they are pushing back. They are, yeah. They're getting out of these social platforms, like you're saying. Mm. It feels like you want to get out of the platform. So what that in, ends up doing is that it removes women from something that is building the society to the future. Mm -hmm. So women are not participating in conversations on social media because they are afraid of, of, of the violence. Mm -hmm. And therefore, generally, the voice of the woman, the voice of the girl is being reduced from a space that is very important mm -hmm. uh, moving forward. And then on the issue of the fact that specifically for you, you know, when you started, you all said, I speak too much and I get into in trouble. trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why is that? It's because society has created a situation, it's a misogynistic perspective mm -hmm. where why would you as a woman want to speak? Mm -hmm. And I know uh, one of the media personalities, uh, Caroline, she has a, a, a YouTube, when she does something, she says, Mimi uh, mm -hmm. because you see a lot of people when she puts her opinion there, the first thing they do is, you know, mitigate mm -hmm. and you know push mm -hmm. on her why why would you as a woman have the audacity mm -hmm. to say or have an opinion about one two three mm -hmm. so that kind of violence you experience should be even now to fool you mm -hmm. to call out all yeah. the nonsense that is happening <laughs> within the society within mm -hmm. the space because the violence is not just because because you said something wrong mm -hmm. the violence is about silencing you silencing the voices sure. of the people you're speaking on. I, I do love yeah. though that there's also there's also the power of what the digital space has brought about. You know like everything there's good and bad and it's mm -hmm. true we you know women do get the brunt but there's also a lot of um, amazing interventions that have happened because of people speaking That's up true. on social media. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's it's a space that I I think I found especially when I kind of transitioned from mainstream I just really enjoyed engaging people on that digital space and people saying, oh, you know, and inviting people into the space to learn more and enhance mm -hmm. their own agency. So it's, I think it's also to speak to, yes, it's risky to put your voice out there. Mm -hmm. 
And I think to the point you made, let's also create those safe spaces online where if somebody is being attacked, are we there to stand with her? Mm -hmm. And sometimes people tell me, I will not go back on Twitter because I was attacked and I just didn't feel like people stood with me. Yeah. So I think there's so many incredible women with incredible stories to tell, but they're yeah. like, those streets are not for me, because yes. they're not for the faint-hearted, and yet it's a very incredible space to, to share your story. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like we've kind of given we final have, comments. You were yeah. going to give, no, no, say something about... No, you say... A red flag. Red flags, right. No, I think <laughs> when it comes to, like, w what you were saying, educating our girls, um, and sometimes when you say red flags, you know sometimes you don't see. I don't know whether it's the love. <laughs> you don't see it. It's here in your face, but you don't see it. I think we need to educate them from a very young age mm. in high school. Tell them this is what abuse is. This mm. is emotional abuse. It's psychological abuse. Mm. This is physical. What is it? Break it down. Because mm. they don't believe emotional abuse is abuse. They don't even know mm. what it is like. When I'm going to talk to the teens, they have no information on you know, yeah. family and planning. And same thing with the GBV. Yeah. It starts very small. With, with your daughter, when they are in school and there's a boy asking for their lunch, you mm -hmm. know, share your lunch mm -hmm. with me. Mm -hmm. It's okay to tell that girl, say no, you don't yeah. want to, mm -hmm. you know, to share your lunch. It mm -hmm. starts with small things like yeah. you, we were in the field playing, John came and he wanted my ball, mm -hmm. uh, he decided to take, so he took yeah. the ball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's okay to teach that girl, even in small situations. Say no. Mm. Say no. Yeah, I think say that's no, my daughter's okay. favorite. Because yeah. also, oh, if, you, ca if no. you can't say no, then you then won't you say yeah. the big no mm -hmm. later, no, right? And it's it's a muscle that you, is, you, you is. need to And you feel they need to explain. Even now, we yeah. are learning, like, why, why do I have to explain? I said no. Do you want to meet up? No. Mm. I, I don't need to explain yeah. anything. <laughs> yes. It's hard. It's yes. really hard. I think this conversation could go on. I think... <laughs> no, it's, it's such an important yes. conversation. And I'm, I'm glad we're having these conversations more and more and more. I feel like in, in a way, somebody out there is finding their voice through our voices. Yeah. And I know that I think the three of us experience it when people say, when so-and-so shared her story on your platform, it encouraged yes. me to do the same. Mm. I, I know recently when everything was happening, um, with the radio presenters ETC, I know somebody DM'd me and said, you don't know this, but when you guys stand, f stand for, stand up and speak out, you're standing for some of us. So she then admitted to me on DM that she'd experienced something like that, which is physical assault because she refused somebody's advances. But she's like, there's no way I can share my voice. I'm too crippled by my trauma, so I can't speak. Oh. Yeah, so there's a lot of that. I think we take, sometimes we may not know it, but by sharing, by using our voices, we're giving other people their voice. So that's true. let's and, keep and doing it. And sometimes vocabulary as well. Like exactly, you that you can yourself, express it. Yeah. And yeah, let's do that so that we give other people the encouragement to use their own voice. Because mm -hmm. I, I feel like everyone has a voice. Even those who think their voices, I'm like, no, you have a voice. Mm -hmm. But it's encouraging them to slowly begin to share their truth but to your point, let's create safe spaces. Because unless those are there, they'll be like, you know what, it's fine. Mm. I will be quiet with my trauma. I will be quiet with my experience. Mm. And then let's also speak to the perpetrators mm. and calling that out. So we could go on. <laughs> Thank you so much, all of you, for your wisdom and experiences and recommendations. Invaluable. Catherine, Valentine, Felister, thank you so, so much. Thank you for watching. Um, I know this conversation can be a trigger, so I'm sorry if you're triggered, but... It's important that we have these conversations. There are national hotlines that I think I tried one the other day as a test and it actually worked. Mm. Um, we'll try and link resources down below because you should not be a victim and you shouldn't stay with your trauma. You shouldn't stay in an environment that is unsafe for you. We know that it's easier said than done and the best we can do is keep having these conversations to give you the courage to make um, an important decision in your life. Um, this is with Equality Now, Better for Kenya and Capital FM. I'm Janet Bogwa. Thank you for watching. And let's keep the conversation going. Use the hashtag Your Voice Matters and the hashtag Act for Equal as we go towards the Generation Equality Forum later in June. Thanks for watching. Bye.